America's Heartland is made possible by Farm Credit, financing agriculture and rural America since 1916. Farm Credit is cooperatively owned by America's farmers and ranchers. Learn more at farmcredit.com. Crop Life America, representing the companies whose modern farming innovations help America's farmers provide nutritious food for communities around the globe. Hi, I'm Rob Stewart. We're dealing in dairy on this edition of America's Heartland. Got milk, got cheese, and how about a milkman who brings the best of both directly to your door? We'll take you to Idaho to meet a farm family whose focus on protecting the environment is a key ingredient in their dairy operation. Then we travel to Tennessee where Jim and Gail Tanner serve up award-winning cheese made from goat's milk. Sharon Vatman is in the kitchen with some recipes that deliver something just a bit different in our Farm to Fork segment. And we'll take you to Minnesota where the old style milkman is not a thing of the past. It's dairy Hello, delivery wow. door to door. Good. All coming up on America's Heartland. Good. You got your stuff here. Okay, thanks. You can see it in the eyes of every woman and man in America's Heartland. Living close to the land There's a love for the country And a pride in the brand In America's heartland Living close Close to the land Dairy products, including milk from cows, are one of the food groups that the U.S. Department of Agriculture says are important to our good health. Things like milk, cheese, and yogurt can provide essential calcium and protein to our diets. Well, there are more than 50,000 dairy farms in the U.S. answering consumer demands that continue to change. Travel back to 1975 and the majority of Americans were drinking whole milk with much smaller numbers consuming low-fat products like 2% and skim milk. That's all changed today. Reacting to health concerns and weight issues, the majority of Americans now choose the low-fat options from the supermarket dairy case. A totally different story in the cheese department. A quarter century back, the average American consumed about 26 pounds of cheese each year. Fast forward and today, most of us are eating more than 30 pounds annually. Consumer demands continue to impact production for America's dairy farmers, but that's not all. Dairy farms, like other agricultural enterprises, must also address environmental issues and things like animal welfare. For one farm in Idaho, that requires a family focus on quality. Idaho is one of the top five dairy producing states in the nation. And if you travel east of Boise to a region called the Magic Valley, you'll find a farm whose cattle count is an important part of the state's dairy production. Am I accurate in saying that you have 20,000 cows? We have 20,000 dairy animals. We're a large family farm, but we are still, the heart and soul of it, the core of it is a family operation. Mike Roth is the latest in a long line of family farmers. My grandparents came from uh, Switzerland in 1921, and um, they landed in Portland, Oregon, and they uh, milked cows by hand. Milking thousands of cows each day requires almost military precision in handling your animals and milk. You can milk 100 cows in 15 minutes here. I can't imagine how much milk you crank out a day. Total Farm produces about 510,000 pounds of milk a day. So this is around the clock. 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. It takes a lot of people, a lot of dedicated people. We have a, we have a large family. I've got eight brothers and sisters. Uh, my father's uh, passed away. My mom is still here. She's 87 years old. Family matriarch Mary Ellen Roth is still very much a part of the operation. The farm's name is a combination of her middle name and that of her late husband, Simon. We never got to go on vacations and things like everybody else because you always had to milk the cows, put the hay in, and uh, it was just always there. It was a 24-hour-a-day job. 
put your finger right in here. See? Yeah. Put it in there. As you might imagine, the work here means attention to another aspect of dairy He's production. Hungry. He's hungry, isn't he? so funny. Yeah. With both of our dairies, there's approximately um, 40 to 45 uh, calves born a day. We have a full-time veterinarian that assists us and makes recommendations. We'll have up to probably five different rations depending on the stage of lactation of the cow and how much milk they're producing. Do you see um, a, a better production of milk and meat from the cows because of better feeding practices in the industry? Oh, there's no doubt. It, if you look at the, the uh, over time, over the last 50 years, how much a, a cow produces, we've probably gone from 10, 12,000 pounds per head per year to over 20,000. And even for an operation this large, the bottom line demands economies that look at environmental considerations too. You have to have a sustainability circle. We buy very little commercial fertilizer and we use our own cow manure to produce our crops, to feed our cattle, and the crops do quite well. And that in turn should uh, reduce the carbon footprint. And we understand that and that's what we are trying to do. As part of their efforts, the family created man-made wetlands, supporting populations of birds and waterfowl. Mike says it's all part of practices that benefit man and animals. Animal welfare, in my mind, is part of the circle of sustainability. Animal welfare is taking care of the animal so that in the end, she takes care of you. It would be not beneficial of anyone not to take care of their animals for just that reason. While most of us think of dairy cows when it comes to making cheese, milk from other animals has been used for centuries. Not only goats and sheep, but camels and water buffalo as well. Artisanal cheese is one of the fastest growing segments of the American dairy industry. And we're not just talking about cheese made from cow's milk. If you're talking about artisanal cheese, the delicacies made from goat's milk should certainly be added to the list. Consumption in the U.S. is up, not only because we've become a little more adventurous in our food choices, but because changing demographics in the U.S. population have added to the demand. Our Yolanda Vasquez says that's good news for one small farm down south. Sometimes this old farm seems like a long lost friend. Jim Tanner had no idea how prescient the words to this song would be until he and his wife Gail there we go. There we go. packed up everything they owned, including nearly a dozen goats, and moved from the hustle and bustle of Northern California to the quiet solitude of Middle Tennessee. Goats have been a part of Gail's life after receiving one as a birthday present in her 20s. We knew the lifestyle that we had with the goats and, and such was going to start to be more and more limited, uh, so it was time to go. It also came at a time when the Tanners were getting serious about breeding goats and creating an agricultural business. So they chose this remote spot with more than 100 acres of pastures, woods, and a babbling brook to build Bonnie Blue Farm. We owned the property for about uh, four years before we moved here. So during those four years, we would come back uh, periodically and work on this and that and the other thing. It was kind of like our vacation. Typically, we came back in, at Christmas time. So when the retired couple arrived for good in 1999, they first built this barn to house their goats. They then added Sanin and Nubian goats to the herd. The Sanins for their higher milk production, the Nubians for higher butterfat content. And with the larger herd in place, Gail saw an opportunity. Well, if you're going to have more goats, then you have to have something to do with the milk. And that's where this modern day milking parlor comes into play. They had the milk, so why not make farmstead cheese? Gail hand milked some of the goats. That liquid is placed in a small container, which is later used to feed the baby goats, called kids. The rest of the milk is collected by automatic pumps to cool for up to 72 hours. When it's time to make cheese, Jim transfers the milk out of the tank into stainless steel containers that end up in the Tanner's Cheese Studio. The Cheese Studio machinery pasteurizes more than 40 gallons of goat milk at a time. 
Uh, you're gonna hog it all, huh? Meantime, the tanners handle the care and feeding of their herd. Gail often walks around with her yellow wagon in tow. Are you guys ready? She puts out alfalfa hay, fills up feed bowls with grain, bottle feeds the kids, checks on the bucks across the creek, and with whatever time is left over, tends to the chickens. A friend that came and visited who really wants to get away from her, her uh, desk job and be a, be a farmer, she says, maybe you just trade in one set of stresses for another. <laughs> But one role that doesn't stress her out is that of cheesemaker extraordinaire. She's become pretty good at whipping up batches of now award-winning goat's milk, feta, and raw milk cheeses. This is what we look for, the magic clean break, they call it. Using her cheese knife, Gail separates the curd from the liquidy substance known as whey. It begins to take on a cottage cheese look. It's time consuming and patience is the cheesemaker's best friend. With the whey removed, the curds will drain overnight. These tubs will eventually be packaged as feta cheese. Bonnie Blue Farm turns out more than a half dozen products. They've become a favorite at area farmers markets, but Jim's marketing efforts have also produced a demand in Memphis and other parts of Tennessee. Or I go to the, you know, to demonstrate the cheese uh, to a chef, and um, I'm thinking of two or three of them, so this is the best feta I ever had. Yeah, we've got to have this on our menu. And I mean, those are direct quotes. Gail says the good feedback is a result of the work and care they put into their farm, their milk, and their cheese. The modest rural Tennessee lifestyle, one they can share with their good-natured goats. That's why our trees are all trimmed up so nice. <laughs> Goats are a popular animal, and around the world, goat's milk is drunk much more often than milk from a cow. Goat's milk is whiter than cow's milk, and in addition to cheese, it is used to make butter, ice cream, yogurt, candy, and soap. Hey, what were you doing back in 1973? Well, if you were around then, there's a good chance you were eating cottage cheese. It was the top cottage cheese consumption year with Americans eating almost five and a half pounds of it per person. Well, we eat less than half of that these days, but there are more options now when it comes to your cottage cheese choices. It seems like people either love or hate cottage cheese. There's not much middle ground but it's considered the first cheese ever made in America. And just like milk off the shelf, you'll find low-fat cottage cheese and low-sodium, even cottage cheese with fruit included. So what exactly is cottage cheese? Well, it's made from milk and gets its start just like cheese curds, but instead of pressing the curds, they get heated, rolled, and washed, and then cream and salt get added. Oh, and why is it called cottage cheese? Well, the name dates back to the mid-1800s when milk left over after the butter making process was used to make a simple cheese. And where was it done? Uh, you guessed it, in cottages. We talked about the Department of Agriculture food groups earlier in the show. You know, the right balance of fruits, vegetables, proteins, grains, and dairy. Well, our Sharon Vaknin is an expert on combining the best of American agriculture and serving up recipes that you can try at home. There's a good reason why lots of favorite comfort foods include some kind of dairy product. Butter, milk, cheese, they're a staple in any fridge, especially mine. So let's whip up a couple new takes on American favorites. We're making angry mac and cheese and no-bake raspberry cheesecake cups. First up, our angry mac and cheese. Now the angry part means that this dish is going to be spicy. I'm using three types of cheeses for today's dish. I have pepper jack cheese, which is Monterey Jack with some peppers blended in, it's spicy. I have sharp cheddar and manchego cheese, which is a sheep's milk cheese. 
Now, what makes this mac and cheese angry is this ingredient, chili garlic paste. And it's exactly what it sounds like, chilies and garlic. We have our star ingredients, let's make this mac and cheese. The base to any great mac and cheese is a good roux. And to make the roux, it only takes two ingredients, butter and flour. That's what's going to thicken up our cheese sauce. In goes the butter over medium high heat. Once this butter melts, we'll add an equal amount of flour. It's always one tablespoon of butter to one tablespoon of flour. Once the flour is added, you want to start whisking immediately until the two are combined to create a sort of paste. You'll see it's thickening up, it's bubbling a little bit. The flour and the butter are cooking together to create a nutty flavor. Now we add two and a half cups of warmed milk, right on top. Just slowly combine them. Lots of people are really intimidated by creating a roux, but it's much more simple than it seems. So now that the milk is added, we'll let it thicken up with the roux for a couple of minutes to ensure a creamy mac and cheese. Once the base is thick like this, we'll take it off the heat and we'll start adding our cheese. Combine them to make our cheese sauce. Our cheese sauce looks fantastic, but now we have to season it. So I throw in Dijon mustard. You could also use powdered mustard here if you want. Salt to bring out the cheese flavor. Ground black pepper. And our angry ingredient, the chili garlic paste. So here's where you have a little bit of flexibility. You can make your mac and cheese a little annoyed. You can make it angry, but I like my mac and cheese absolutely furious. So I'll give it two and a half tablespoons. And you'll see the cheese sauce take on a beautiful reddish pink color. Our cheese sauce is spicy, seasoned, and ready for our pasta. I'm using cavatappi, which looks like this, little spirals with ridges. And the ridges are great because they'll really grab onto the cheese sauce. So let's throw in our pasta. Lots of people like to use breadcrumbs, but I have my own take. We're using salt and pepper potato chips as our topping. So all I do is put the potato chips in a little Ziploc bag and go to town. It's kind of fun. Take our crushed potato chips. Put it right on top. All right, our mac is ready to go in the oven for about 25 minutes until our topping gets golden brown and the cheese is bubbling. While that bakes, let's work on our dessert. We're making no-bake lemon raspberry cheesecake cups, and I've got a guilt-free version. The first thing that goes into our mixer is non-fat Greek yogurt. I love Greek yogurt because it's a great replacement for other fatty cheeses or even heavy whipping cream. To that, we'll add four ounces of softened, low-fat cream cheese. And finally, some powdered sugar. Start that on low. I'll add a splash of whole milk and vanilla extract. Whip it for a couple more minutes. Our cheesecake filling looks good, and now we can start assembling the cups. First, we'll take a few vanilla wafers and just break them up. Then, we'll take lemon curd, dollop at the bottom of each. Then, we'll take our cheesecake filling. It has a nice, creamy texture. It's a little sweet from the powdered sugar, but it also has a tang from the Greek yogurt. And to top them off, we'll put fresh raspberries right on top. And the last touch is fresh mint. Just pop them right on top. Our cheesecake cups are set. They're looking beautiful. And our angry mac and cheese has just come out of the oven. And it looks and smells amazing. There's a whole lot of dairy here, but I'm loving every bit of it.
We've given you some details on dairy in the show this time, and we know that most of you head out to the supermarket to pick up the milk, cheese, yogurt, sour cream, or other dairy products that you use at home. But for some consumers, dairy is delivered to them. Our Jason Schultz says that's the good news in one Minnesota community where you'll find old style milkmen going door to door. The sun is barely up here in Minneapolis and Mike White is hard at work. Place for everything and everything in its place. Loading up his milk, cheese and butter, he and the other independent milkmen from around the area are preparing for another day. The sun will be setting by the time Mike is done with his route. We do about 50 to 70 stops depending upon the day and how big the stops are. Mike owns his own truck and has a contract with Kemp's Dairy to deliver milk and other food items. So when you drive down the street like this, are you thinking potential customer, potential customer? Oh yeah, I mean, you always yeah. keep your eyes open. Swing sets, kids toys. Mike's been driving these streets for 34 years. And after that many years. She's barking. Make her happy. Uh, He's learned the tricks of the trade. Barking I dogs get treats. So much. What a good girl. And customers get the extra effort. When Raleigh Troop at the Bean Good Cafe is running out of milk for her coffee drinks. We were a little busier Friday and Saturday than I thought. And oh my gosh, here we are low and Mike to the rescue. Even though she's not on this morning's route, Mike makes a special stop for this business customer. People often talk about the good old days, although it's not always an accurate way to describe the past. But if the classic milkman was ever a symbol for anything, it's a symbol of a simpler time. And for Mike's customers, that simpler, more trusting time still exists today. Close the door when you're done. Oh, I will. Like at this stop, when the homeowner is on her way out, she leaves the door unlocked for Mike. So I know what to do. I just take care of it. All right. Oh, we got, we've got doggies. So, so these are things that you think they may need because you know them. Right. So right. you bring them in just in case, and some yep. stuff you refill, and others you don't. Yep. Just give them what they need. The double fudge moose tracks. <laughs> They're about gone. Their son Teddy loves that. That's his favorite. Not only do you know your customers by their first names, you know their customers' children by their first name. Yeah. Yes. Usually and hopefully. <laughs> Not all of them sometimes. And you know their eating habits, too. That I know the most, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's get And after right. he's done stocking up, it's off to the next stop. I've, so many families, you, uh, you know them for, I mean, after 34 years, you've seen their kids grow up, and then you see them show up there and bring the, the grandkids and their kids. Good morning. Mike's been bringing the staples and then some to the Northrop family for 11 years. People think of the old milkman who, you know, drives his truck, delivers the milk, but he's yeah. bringing a lot of stuff for you, right? Oh, yeah, more than just milk. And, I mean, there's meats and um, deli meats and cheeses and, I mean, it's a wide range. The profit margin for dairy products is very thin, so to stay competitive, home delivery drivers like Mike have moved beyond milk. Mike's truck today has as many as 400 items for sale. What about the cost? Is it, do you think, is Very it more comparable. expensive than the grocery um, store a little if bit? If it is, it's mediate, you know, it evens out in terms of driving and carrying stuff too. That's the other element, just to not have to carry in heavy stuff. Hello, hi, how are you? Here's some bread. Convenience and the personal touch are how home delivery drivers compete against the corner stores and big box retail. To find what dealt the fatal blow to most home delivery in the 1970s, look no further than the explosion in popularity of convenience stores across the country. Until the recent economic downturn, there was a resurgence of home milk delivery in other U.S. cities. And while the home milk delivery market is no more than 2% of sales for Kemp's here in Minnesota, manager Pat Elwell says he believes there will always be a place for guys like Mike. Always going to be people that want freshness, quality, and they want that personal service. They want to talk to the owner of a business. And I just, I don't ever see it going away. I'm the third generation milkman and uh, my grandpa and my dad 
They started it out. Ironically, following in their footsteps was not part of his original plan, but after a stint in a rock band and working at gas stations in a restaurant. And then I decided, you know, I gotta really make a living. And 34 years later, he's making a living in a tough business with a smile and a wave. That'll do it for this time. Thanks for traveling the country with us on this edition of America's Heartland. We're always pleased that you can join us. And before we go, let me remind you that you can check out videos from today's show or any of our other programs at our website, americasheartland.org. And don't forget to look for us on your favorite social media websites. We'll see you next time on America's Heartland. You can purchase a DVD or Blu-ray copy of this program. Here's the cost. To order, just visit us online or call 888-814-3923. You can see it in the eyes of every woman. Here you go, have another one. In America's heartland, living close to the land. There's a love for the country and a pride in the brand. In America's heartland. Living close, close to the land. America's Heartland is made possible by Farm Credit, financing agriculture and rural America since 1916. Farm Credit is cooperatively owned by America's farmers and ranchers. Learn more at farmcredit.com. Crop Life America, representing the companies whose modern farming innovations help America's farmers provide nutritious food for communities around the globe.